The city of Bruges in Belgium has so many well-preserved medieval and neo-Gothic buildings that the entire town is like an outdoor museum. And you can go into several actual museums to enjoy fascinating art, sculpture, and history. The Gothic churches also contain many great works of art enclosed in the spectacular old architecture with a statue by Michelangelo and brightly colored stained glass windows all around you. Later, we shall visit inside the magnificent cathedral, then step into a 19th century classroom. Some museums are located right along the canals. Our first visit brings us inside the Gruninger Museum with its priceless collection of Flemish masters and other Belgian visual arts covering six centuries starting out with the most wonderful and important painting in Bruges, the Madonna and Child by Van Eyck, the great artist who lived in Bruges in the last 12 years of his life. Filled with brilliant colors and fine details, it depicts Mary and baby Jesus, flanked by two saints and an official of the church. He's that old man in the white robe who's included because he paid Van Eyck to make the painting. The minute details and architecture of the room and windows are depicted with high degree of realism. Notice that little Jesus is holding a bouquet of flowers and a green parrot. Paintings by the Flemish masters are the main reason why many visitors come to the Gruninger Museum, including such artists as Hans Memling and Hieronymus Bosch represented here with his last judgment in his typical tortured figures and bizarre monsters. Various important artists were attracted to Bruges during the 14th through 16th centuries because the city was so wealthy with many rich merchants and religious institutions that were ready to purchase the paintings. These artists devoted a great deal of attention to high quality materials and careful techniques, often involving oil painting, which had just been perfected during that time. So these works created 500 years ago have retained their extremely high quality and enormous value to this very day. The museum also has some modern art. The museum is located next to a charming little park that was once the private garden of a manor house, but now is open to the public. A great place to relax and take in the beautiful surroundings. The park is child-friendly and baby carriages are allowed. It's a popular spot for picnics. Also known for its picturesque humpback pedestrian St. Boniface Bridge. The park is also next to the Grützeser Museum which is housed in a lavish 15th century palace that looks something like a castle. The courtyard is open to the public for free and has some wonderful buildings around it in various styles from the Middle Ages through the late period. It's so photogenic you will be compelled to take lots of pictures. With the right angle you can also get the canal and park into your background an architectural gem blending medieval and neo-Gothic styles. The palace was built to impress and it's been doing so in style ever since. It originally served as the opulent residence of a powerful Lord who was patron of the arts. Now it's a museum showcasing a captivating collection of artwork and artifacts spanning from the 15th through the 19th centuries. In the 15th century, the building was expanded from a store into a luxury mansion. And there's a painting on display of Louis, one of the early lords of the manor. Some restoration work was done in the 19th century and a recent project concluded in 2018 with major renovations of the interior and outside. Among the treasures is the terracotta portrait of Charles V, who was born in nearby Ghent and went on to become Holy Roman Emperor, one of the most powerful people in Europe. History is brought to life by more than 600 exhibits, each of which has its own story to tell, from majestic tapestries to elegant wooden sculptures, old books and manuscripts, an 18th century dinner table, Chinese porcelain, and period furniture. Among many religious items, there are Madonnas and silver chalices for the Mass. 
A model of an old sailing ship reminds us of the rich maritime history. From the upper floor, you have a lovely view down into the lobby area, and then step outside onto the balcony. From this romantic perspective, you get a dramatic view of the photogenic surroundings, including a bird's eye view of St. Boniface Bridge and a gabled mansion. Then on the right side, notice how close the Church of Our Lady is. It's right next door, which makes an excellent place to visit after leaving the museum. That belfry above the Church of Our Lady is the world's third tallest brick tower at 115 meters, looking up at the highest point of the city. The church dates back to the 13th century, built in the Gothic style with cross rib vaulting on the ceiling and later Baroque decoration. The most important reason this church is so famous is the sculpture in the side chapel because it was the only statue by Michelangelo that ever left Italy during his lifetime. It was originally intended for the Siena Cathedral, but Michelangelo was never paid for that Siena project, so he canceled that work and sold the statue to a couple of merchants from Bruges, who then donated it to the church. This led to 20 years of legal headaches for Michelangelo, who was sued for not completing that Siena project. There are double aisles along both sides of the nave, which is 25 meters wide and a length of 60 meters. The church is not just a museum of art, it's also a living place of Catholic worship where you could attend a service. You can walk into a couple of the small side chapels where the wealthy could pray in private. Rich people paid to build these chapels in order to help them get to heaven, which was a good moneymaker for the church. You'll see beautiful artworks incorporated into the structure of the building, such as these Baroque-style confessionals, and a side chapel with stained glass windows and Gothic ribbed vaulting. In the choir space behind the high altar, there are tombs of Charles the Bold and his daughter, the Duchess Mary. These gilded bronze effigies of father and daughter repose at full length on polished slabs of black stone. Both are crowned and Charles is represented in full armor wearing the decoration of the Order of the Golden Fleece. The dress and ornamentation of the bronzed Mary is consistent with the Gothic style. These are among the most impressive tombs in 16th century Europe in a prominent location in this major church because Charles and Mary were so important to the history of Bruges and the region. After their death, Mary's husband, Maximilian I, became Holy Roman Emperor and incorporated Bruges into his empire. There was a modest church on this site already in the 9th century, but construction of the present church began in the 13th century and took 200 years. The Gothic style was later enhanced with the Baroque ornamentations. The church is beautiful from the outside, but as you've seen, it's worth going in to enjoy the incredible artworks that you will see with the stained glass and Michelangelo and everything else for the slight fee of eight euro, unless you have the Bruges Museum card. Just across the street, we have the Hospital of St. John, which is one of the oldest hospital buildings in Europe and contains some major artworks inside especially famous for the works of Hans Memling. Just entering the building from the street is another adventure in itself and a reminder about the incredible medieval architecture of Bruges. It's like walking through a time tunnel built in brick. We emerge into a lovely courtyard with those old buildings around it, like a plaza, almost like a public park in the middle of the city and then the entrance to the museum is just on the right. Hans Memling was a 15th century master of hyper-realistic scenes who lived and worked in Bruges and created his most important masterpieces there. The museum also has an authentically preserved hospital pharmacy. You can imagine how the nuns in their rustling black and white robes process the herbs into medicine. The room served as a pharmacy, laboratory, and nursing room. 
Anyone who needed care or a place to sleep was welcome there, regardless of origin or class. The pharmacy will take you on a journey into history. You are also welcome to walk around the gardens and courtyards of the building to complete your visit. It's located on one of the main canals, which is a popular route for the canal boat tours. Another place you would enjoy visiting is the Folk Museum, where you learn all about the ordinary daily life in Bruges in the 19th and early 20th centuries. This nostalgic museum is housed in what had been single-room homes for poor people, renovated now with a garden courtyard and covered walkways. As you walk through the series of rooms, it feels like you've entered a typical 19th century village with its shops, such as this shoemaker with a realistic depiction of the racks of shoes and authentic tools in this cobbler's workshop. A grocery shop has a large assortment of grains and seeds in open bins, ready to be scooped. The pharmacy has items from a real store in Bruges that was created first in 1863. When it closed in 1975, the museum purchased its contents. The hats displayed in this workshop were donated by three milliners based in Bruges, who took direct measures of customers' heads. It looks like you can walk into this tailor shop and get measured for a custom-made suit. A popular exhibit is the 19th century classroom, furnished with authentic desks, chairs, and chalkboards. Toys and games and old sleds are featured, with some items from the 1950s and others much earlier, including some small models of clay figures. Confectionaries would make their own candies from sugars and chocolates and customized molds. Their authentic equipment is part of the display. The craft of barrel maker or cooper was very important in Bruges where there were once dozens of breweries that had to store their beer. You'll enter a Flemish living room which combined a kitchen with daily activities, breakfast on the table and dishes piling up in the sink. Upstairs has space for special exhibits. This one is about living rooms of the 1950s. The museum is a great place to learn about the daily life of Bruges in the past. When finished, drop into their Black Cat Cafe for some refreshments. The only problem with your visit is the museum is not in the town center. It's one kilometer away from the market square. But while in the neighborhood, there's another fascinating thing to see, an ancient church, one of the hidden treasures of Bruges. Consecrated in 1429, the chapel was inspired by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, with an ancient architectural style predating Gothic and Romanesque. A dramatic altar features many skulls serving as memento mori, reminders of death originally constructed by the Adorns family, and now 600 years and 17 generations later, it's still owned by descendants of the same family in a complex that includes several other buildings and a small museum. That family came from Genoa in Italy and settled in Bruges about the year 1300. Through clever trading and strategic marriages, they rose to high ranks of power and made a vast fortune they used to take a pilgrimage trip to Jerusalem and come back to build this complex, which also has a small lush garden in the courtyard, open to the public for a slight admission fee, and well worth it. From here, we are walking back into the center of Bruges to visit the cathedral. A lovely way to approach it is along Maria Strat and then on a side lane that will bring you to the outside of the back of the church, the Gothic masterpiece of St. Salvatore's Cathedral, in English, St. Savior, whose tower reaches 99 meters high. Upon entering, you will be impressed by the enormous space of the interior, 100 meters long, greatest width at 52 meters, and ceiling 28 meters high with a forest of massive columns outlining the nave and aisles, creating intricate spaces that are delightful to wander through as you look all around and above at the cross-rib vaulted ceiling. 
It's the oldest parish church in Bruges with a history that goes back to the mid seventh century when it was a wooden structure replaced by this Gothic marvel constructed between the 12th and early 16th centuries. Many works of art have been added later, such as this fine altar in the Baroque style with a meandering labyrinth pattern on the floor. You can also walk around behind the altar, which is just as beautiful as the front in that same Baroque style decorated with many beautiful statues. It's an active Episcopal church offering mass daily. A rich collection of Flemish tapestries decorates the sides of the altar and around to the choir in front with two rows of wooden choir stalls for seating of the clergy and the chorus. Altogether, there are about 40 altars in the various chapels, along with 120 paintings and various gold and silver objects, many of which are in the church museum. The crossing where the transepts, nave, and altar come together is the most spacious and highest part of the church, offering a splendid experience to enjoy its many angles and perspectives. As we walk back into the nave, you'll notice on the left side that wooden pulpit was made in 1605. And at the far end, there is the rood screen, the black and white collection of sculptures and architecture, columns and arches surmounted by a statue of God. And above that, the organ placed here in 1682. The rood screen originally stood as a barrier between the nave and the choir and was moved here in the 1930s. It's a great place to take pictures and the best approach here is to walk all around and get different angles, looking up, looking to the side aisles, looking at the windows, close-ups, wide angles, and video. Every place you turn, there's another beautiful photo opportunity. This church was not originally built to be a cathedral. It was granted this status in 1834 because the previous cathedral in a different part of Bruges was destroyed during the French Revolution by French iconoclasts who were not fans of religious buildings. The ambulatory behind the altar is one of the most interesting parts of the building with its curved aisle and chapels and stained glass radiating out from it. It is really quite dramatic. It's worth stepping inside several of these chapels to appreciate the artworks they are filled with, especially the colorful, radiant stained glass. The architecture of the church is what's called Brabant Gothic, found throughout Flanders, but the ambulatory is a later style of flamboyant Gothic, added two centuries after the church was built. Occasionally, restoration work took place and recently the cathedral was completely restored between 1987 and 2017. The cathedral has an excellent website with lots of history and information and there's a virtual tour you can walk through the entire space and a greeting that welcomes everyone regardless of origin, religion or philosophical belief and they have occasional music performances. Bruges will keep you so busy with all of these wonderful churches, museums, and many other sites that you'll want to spend at least a couple of days here. Upon exiting the cathedral, you'll be right on the main street of town, Steenstraat, to continue your explorations. To learn more about Bruges and prepare for your visit, take a look at the official website of the Tourist Information Office, loaded with helpful information. And there's a website for the Museums of Bruges where you can learn about buying the museum card and find out more about the many museums of Bruges. We frequently upload new movies, so please subscribe to our channel and click that little alarm bell so you'll be notified. And if you enjoyed the movie, how about a thumbs up? And we always welcome comments down below. Or if you have questions about the destination, make note and we'll answer them. Thanks for watching.